A few weeks ago, my friend Mariana Salorich, she's the president of PMWN Zagreb, Professional Women's Network in Croatia, invited me to speak at their first network meeting on 2021. The topic was deconstructing fear as a way to experience more freedom in a personal level and also as a way to create more inclusive and innovative business cultures. I'm very happy to share with you an edited version of the entire session and I really hope you will find something useful. So as I was telling you, I was born in Peru. Uh, I came here, I got in love with one Slovenian girl and uh, and soon, soon enough, I, I decided to move here. In, in my previous life, I was working in IT. I was a very close partner with Microsoft. And then after a while, I decided to switch. I decided to make a big change. Uh, something similar like uh, what is happening to many people that goes out of corporations to start something new, right? Uh, it was something similar to me. I was an entrepreneur, but I was working with corporations, right? So uh, it was quite a, a big change. But the biggest thing was that I decided to become a social entrepreneur. So this is me when I was a little kid, and that's my mom. Yes, I had hair, and yes, I was blonde. Uh, and is my mom the one that said, yeah, yeah, boys are really, really nice when they are little, but then they grow. So what you're looking in your screen, if you can see my face, this is what happened. <laughs> okay, so to start, the topic of deconstructing fear, I would really like you to go to your telephone and to uh, go to slido.com, enter this number, 85163, and you will answer one question. Let me see if it is already active. Now it's active. So, the number is 85163. And you have to answer the question um, with one word. Okay, so what is fear for you? I don't know. Fear is uh, hate, or fear is paralysis, or fear is whatever that comes to your mind. You write one word and you enter, and then you can add more words. Okay, so I'm going to let this running for a bit. Uh, uh, so uh, we see how this thing uh, grows. Yeah, that's, that's super, super awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So now we go back here and I want to share a couple of quotes that are, in my opinion, super, super interesting. Pema Chodron, she's a, um, a Buddhist monk and she says that fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. Wow, what does it mean? This is pretty crazy because basically when we start experiencing something new, we often have a sensation of fear. And what is this new having to do with truth? It might be that a new experience is basically going to expose us to something new of our personality. And when we experience that sensation, right, we often tend to feel fear. So knowing something new about me makes me feel like change is happening, therefore I'm afraid. Uh, it's the same Pema Chodron that she said that once she asked a, a, a master Zen teacher, Kobunchi no Roshi, how he related with fear. And he said, I agree, I agree. Do, what does it mean? Do you agree with your fear? Well, actually, I went to research what, what uh, a master uh, uh, Roshi uh, meant. And what when he's trying to say is that whenever you experience fear, 
your fear is trying to tell you something that you don't want to listen. So I repeat, your fear is trying to tell you something that you don't want to listen. So for him, he agrees with his fear because his fear is telling, telling something that is truthful to him. So that's an amazing invitation because that means that when we experience some kind of resistance or fear, actually we are declining to listen what our fear is trying to tell us. A few weeks ago, I made a survey and uh, I got the following results. When I asked uh, people to define fear, they basically said these three uh, things. Fear is an emotion. Fear is survival instinct. And fear is there to protect us. So what do you think about that? Would you agree? Here. Well, this is Tamara. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I would say that, you know, if we look back into history, yes, fear is a survival instinct and fear protects us. Because if we look back to the days of people living in caves and living with dangerous animals around, um, the way we survived is through, you know, being fearful of those uh, uh, animals and uh, hiding from them. So I would say, yes, it comes as a survival instinct and it did protect us. I don't know if it no, um, if it holds true today, but it definitely did in the past. Uh, and how do you think it is today? Uh, probably in certain situations, which are not common today, for example, if somebody is, you know, is trying to kill you or something, I would say that, yes, it's still a survivor instinct for you to hide and to protect yourself and to, you know, to be afraid. But in most normal everyday situations, I think fear stops us from doing certain things and, and is more of an obstruction than, and, than help. Super, thank you so much, Tamara. And I would definitely agree with Tamara. And, and this is something that first comes to my mind when you talk about fear is that it's something uh, that goes back um, into our genes. It's like a primordial instinct that made us survive as, as human beings, as one of the species on, on the earth. And then we should definitely uh, listen uh, because it, it has something to, relevant to say to us. We, what, what I'm listening is that we agree that fear is an emotion, that it, it, it relates with a survival instinct. So it, it, it is trying to protect us from something, right? So we are very much in agreement then with the survey that I made uh, in the past. But I also ask, what is the opposite of fear? And, you know, one of the options was love, okay? But I was completely surprised to see that no one said that the opposite of fear is love. Instead, uh, because we are in a frame of entrepreneurs and we're in, in, in the framework of business, the majority of the people decided to answer faith and hope, being brave and having freedom. So that's also fascinating. Right, because if if fear, uh, the opposite of fear is freedom. That makes a lot of sense because when we release our fear, we experience freedom. Right, but they also said being brave. So what they what what they meant then is, when I'm feeling afraid, getting over over it so listening to my fear and being capable of moving forward is actually the opposite of fear because they would perceive that fear is kind of a paralysis right and they need to act and in order to act they need to be brave uh faith and hope so that was amazing because i asked them what is faith for most of you and they said, faith is knowing that the things are good or bad, you know? But anyway, I have the option of doing something. And hope 
is having the possibility, the mental possibility that things can actually improve. So if you see the majority of the persons that I talk to would say that the opposite of fear achieves freedom through action, you know, through being brave. And that action is possible because we have faith and we hope that things are going to be better. That's really cool. And if you see the world of politics lately, you are going to find a lot of similarities. Okay. So now I want to present you to this little amazing guy. I think this is, that is the best way how to learn because it's authentic. You know, we are born as the photo that I showed you at the beginning, this cute guy with the mother in the flowers and everything and enjoying of life, right? And then I break the first thing and my father screams at me and I get scared, you know? And then as life goes on and on, I start building ways of reacting to how the people disapproves of me and my actions. So each one of these reactions is some kind of a brick. But then when I arrive close to my 30th birthday, I find out that I built a tower around me. And you know, it is so amazing. I built a tower like to defend myself from the enemies, but I also hang a white flag on top that says I'm in peace, just in case. I'm not the bad guys, I'm a good one, so do not attack me. So it is obvious that my fear is something that I've been working for long time, very long time. But you see my eyes inside of the tower are like surprised. And the surprise is there because I find that I can only move inside of the tower and that I forgot to make more windows. So I can only look forward. I can only look to the future, you know? And this, is, this happens when I had around 30 years, right? So, oh, I'm, I'm stuck, you know? But then I'm 47 now. So when I had 40 years around, I felt much better because I knew that I could start throwing the bricks of my fears and start deconstructing the fears that I've built. I still have my white flag just in case someone wants to attack me, you know? But anyway, I'm starting to find that I have more movement and I'm starting to find that I have more freedom. I have more space to operate. I will show you one image that maybe some of you are familiar with. Do you know this? The matryoshka or the babushka as, as uh, uh, different cultures call it. So I'm the one in the, in the middle, the little one, right? And then I find out that I don't have space. So I break the walls around me and I have a bit more, but then I find out that there's another wall. So I have to break another wall and break another wall and break another wall so that my path of life is constantly breaking the limitations that I built, you know? in order to experience freedom. So that is the concept of the constructing fear that I wanted to share with you. So the majority of us are somehow feeling stuck. Some of us even feel burned out. Uh, we don't know what to do. We see that everything is changing in the world, right? In a personal level, in a business level, in a community level, what can we do if everything that we know for certain changed, if everything seems uncertain, the only logical response that we have as human beings is feeling afraid. And that fear manifests in different ways, right? We can be depressed, we can be hyperactive trying to solve problems, we can be, well, you can imagine, there's a lot of things that, that happen. Now, 
this is a fundamental question to me. Can we really learn from failure? Because the, I know that the startup community uh, uh, started saying here and there that we have to fail forward, fail fast, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But can we really learn from failure? Can someone try to answer, please? If I can just add, because I'm doing a lot of mentoring in startup community. And the thing about failing fast is about surviving. Because the worst thing happens and you survive. And this is so, I would say, liberating. And that I would definitely say that we can learn that we survive. And this is something that is lesson learned from failure. I agree uh, with Madenk and Mariana what they said. The only problem here is that if you were raised as failure is something bad, then your fear from failure exponentially rises. So this is the, you cannot fail in anything. You have to be the best. And uh, if you are I mean, the education thing is when you fail, you get one, you fail your class, you don't advance. Uh, but uh, the opposite to this, that you have to be successful 100%. So, uh, so then I have an additional question. Um, how come that we screw it up more than once? How come that we still have the climate crisis problem, the corruption problem? So all the biggest problems that we know are catastrophic failures in the front of our nose. How come that we don't learn from it? So there has to be something there because what you are saying is true. And you know, Mladenka got closer to what I find as the center of the truth here. She said the word authentic. And what, what I guess she means, Mladenka, you can tell me if I'm wrong, okay? But I guess that what she means is that when you are on your knees, when you found that you screw it up in front of everybody, you are so vulnerable that you learn something new from you. You know, and that vulnerability actually, what it means is that you face your biggest fear and you had to face it in front of everybody else. My answer to the question uh, about learning from failure is in some cases, we can learn from failure, especially when we screw it up royally, right? When it's a very big stinky failure. Uh, because there we have no alternative. We cannot escape, right? But in the other cases, maybe we can learn about the circumstances. So of course, the next time that you start your business, please have a business model or call your customers through, right? So there are mechanics that we can learn from failure. But then when, when we don't go deeper in our experience of failure, we cannot know why we screw it up. And those screws up happen, you know, because we are just not listening at something. So for example, I didn't call these persons that owe me money uh, uh, because you know, I'm a nice guy. I don't want them to feel the pressure of, of having to pay me. Yeah, but in the meantime, I'm not paying the telephone company and my access to internet. So at the end, I screw it up because I was trying to be the nice guy. And you know, even I screw it up, my company explodes, you know, I go back home and I said, this is how I am. I'm a nice guy, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm not the right business person. So it's not only that I didn't stop to think what is wrong in the patterns that I have of behavior, you know, is that I use it as an excuse. When I realized that we cannot learn from failure all what we uh, thought we can, 
I found, as Mladenka said, that when you fail, when you fail royally, you face your fears. And when you realize what your fear is, is just at that moment that you can solve it. I read this book from Lisa Feldman that I really recommend you. It's called How Emotions Are Made. And she says something incredible. That is that, so the majority of us think that uh, uh, an emotion happens before a thought before our thinking process. And some people even think that our emotions are very closely related with what some people call intuition. According to Lisa Feldman, that's not true. Okay. Actually, your emotions happen after your thought process. But we get confused because a thought produces a physical emotion and the physical emotion produces more thoughts. So your body perceives something, that's the number one step. So you need a body. <laughs> Thanks God we all have one. The next one is when your perception detects change. It can be movement, right? You're sitting down in the beach, everything is calm, and suddenly an animal crosses, right? Okay, movement triggered the, called your attention, you know, and said something changed. At that moment, you have a mental process. So your mind is going to compare the perception to whatever that you perceived in the past, and it's going to come up with a conclusion, it's a prediction. And it's, it is going to tell you, no, that's a fly that is crossing, you don't need to move, you're fine, right? But maybe you're allergic to flies for saying something. Okay, if you're allergic, then you're going to panic. You are going to stand up and leave or try to kill the animal, whatever. You're going to try to do something and there's a reaction. The way we process the perception and the way we react is what we call our personality. Okay, so this is a bit crazy because that means that if I don't have my patterns of fear, I lose at least part of my personality. This is important because that would mean that freedom that we talked before would be precisely losing that part of your personality that is afraid. That's the part, that's the, mo that's the deconstructing. This is when you're throwing the bricks out of your uh, tower, your castle, right? Now, my personality and your personality interact because we live together. And that's how we create our culture. And that's how it happens that the uh, national cultures, for example, share similar behaviors and treats, right? So I don't see a lot of people in Europe getting pissed off at the politicians and going out with weapons, right? But in other places it's much more violent and it's part of their culture. Is the sum, is the average of the different personalities. So, okay, now, we talked about this part of the fear that is kind of an emotional, uh, uh, sorry, kind of a, an instinctual reaction, right? It's like an instinct. Fear tries to emulate the survival instinct. That means that our fear elevates the sense of urgency, right? So we have a pandemic and we run to buy toilet paper. Right, that's the part that is irrational. So we become a bit crazy and we are trying to anticipate potential problems and we try to solve them as good as we can. But we panic and we go running and we are in the shop with our cart running full speed 
to be sure that we get at, at least a pack of toilet papers, right? So, uh, uh, okay. Now that is my take. Okay, so as we said before, we perceive. But then I divide fear in two. One is what I call re real fear. Okay, so the real fear is indeed there's a lion that comes to, uh, uh, to bite you. Actually, the real fear is nonverbal. So you don't, you don't see or, or you don't hear the, the, the mind telling you, hey, hey, Jose, there's a lion. No, it's in a second you react and you do something about it, right? But then the other part of fear is the one that is called psychological fear. That psychological fear is the one that we are talking about because as someone said earlier, we are no longer in the times of, uh, uh, what is those times? The times of the, the cavemen or something like this, dinosaurs and all this stuff. We are no longer there. Therefore the threats that we have, that we perceive are not necessarily threats to our life or physical integrity are threats to our livelihood, are threats to what we consider a, 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 an ideal way of life, et cetera, et cetera, are psychological. And as we grow, and as I explained to you the process of building your tower, right? Those fears are little programs, right? That are telling you how to behave. So, if one dog beat me when I was a little kid, exists the possibility that if I see a dog today, I feel nervous. That's a pattern, but that, that is not who I am. That's a pattern that builds my personality. So everybody knows that I'm the no dog uncle. But what happens? If someone brings me a puppy and I love the puppy and I adopt it because I was in good mood and I learned to live with the dog and finally I feel the happiness of the dogs and I want to have more. So is Jose a different person? I tend to think that no, okay? Jose was the same guy, but the pattern of behavior, their personality pattern changed. But I was for 40 years afraid of dogs. So how much time I lost? So this is important thing to think about because all those patterns of personality that we defend so strong, you know, I do not dance, do not invite me to the discotheque. I'm not a good seller. You know, no, 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 for sales, do not, hire me, I'm good for research. Those are patterns of behavior that we learned in the past. And when we fail at something, like nobody invites us anywhere because we don't like to dance and we said no so many times, you know, that when we feel the failure as a result of our behavior or pattern, then we change it. Then we change it and we find out that the fear that we had before was illogical. Was completely illogical. So now I want to show you this example. This is the example of the dark room. What happens if you are in a completely dark, huge room? Okay, just imagine that you are in this dark room. Now, how much light do you need to illuminate it? The answer is the minimum light is enough. So if you have a candle, that's good enough. And actually you can take your candle and, and walk around and illuminate the entire room little by little. 
So that is the light of awareness. Okay. I mean, you, you could choose to not light your candle. You could choose to not walk around to see what is there hidden in the darkness. But if you did, if you decided to light the candle and walk around to see what is there around, what you are doing is you are exploring. You are being aware, you are accepting what are you afraid of and how your fear created patterns of behavior that basically are the bricks that build the tower around you. You get it? So I'm inviting you to have a candle. Is the candle of braveness. Is becoming a brave person. Is to recognize how your fear created patterns of behavior that you think are your personality. You think you are that. You are the non-seller, you are the non-dancer, right? Uh, and I invite you to see and experience freedom from those patterns of behavior. So that's what it takes, is the decision of being aware. And you have to have clear concepts because what you are going to do is to decide for freedom, right? But then you need to know what freedom is because it's very easy to say, I'm going to be free as soon as I get the money. But then you get the money and you don't feel free. So basically, you want to be free from fears and from the limitations that you built around you so that you can express yourself in the most authentic light there is. Because if you see everywhere around you, you follow examples of people that are very authentic. We don't believe in the persons that come to sell you something cheap. We believe in the people that comes with an authentic story. Those are persons that went over their fear. And uh, let me share with you something uh, that an artist friend told me not so long ago. Uh, it is about auditioning. And she said to me that, uh, the, the persons that are new in auditioning for, uh, uh, I don't know, acting, right? Uh, they try to not be afraid. So they want to show themselves acting like everything is fine. But the persons that are experienced at auditioning actually maximize their fear. So that when they go in front of the people, the people can see the authentic self, the person going to act feeling uncomfortable. They create the character through authenticity. It's a marriage between the role that they have to do and their fear. But that fear doesn't paralyze them because they know it. And that's how they show emotion through a camera. That's how they show emotion to people that might be in completely different mindsets. And that's why every different person can understand the, 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 the act, you know, in a different way. Um, so I don't know if, if, if that is common knowledge, but that's something that a friend said to me. Um, I, I like this graphic because that heart doesn't mean love. That heart means not ignoring your emotional part and understanding how your emotions operate. Because your emotions are the key to finding what are you afraid 
And as soon as you light the candle of awareness, you automatically start becoming free of your fears because you start discovering that your fears are illogical. Are illogical. They were logical when you were a little kid or when you were a young boy and, and the girlfriend uh, dumped you, right? But it's no longer the same thing. You are not the same person and those are patterns that are not applying anymore, right? And now if you think about some of these crazy old people that we, with, with love and reverence, we tell them a bit crazy, they are not afraid. They do whatever they want. They actually become more like children. And, you know, I was surprised to see that the Buddhists define uh, wisdom as the capacity of behaving as a child despite your knowledge, right? That's why this graphic is about the emotions. It's not about the brain. Your knowledge is there, that's fine. But part of your knowledge are those patterns that are limiting your freedom. But when you get your knowledge and when you get your emotions and you realize how to work with them, you find freedom. Mladenka, would you dare to say something? I'm enjoying listening to you. And um, what I would just like to add is that we can uh, use creativity when we uh, face fear. And I think this is the tool we all have inside. Sometimes we forget that we have such a great amount of creativity inside us. And then this creativity is giving us new ways how to cope with, uh, with, with this unexpected situation because you are, as you said, you are then there with emotions and you want, you know, you want, to, want to be yourself, but you know, still there is fear there. So you have to have some, some kind of tools which can, which can help you. So would you say that to be creative, you need to be brave? Uh, and vulnerable at the same time. So it's, it's being both... Exactly. Thing. So when you manage to have this vulnerability, right, that means knowing which are your emotions, how you feel, and sharing those emotions with everybody else, despite your fear, despite your resistance, well, actually, you became a wise person, right? And there's, there's a reason why they call these uh, 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 artists, so these persons that manage to balance emotion and creativity, they call them masters. Right? So the process of mastery is not the technical, only the technical knowledge of how to achieve something. Because any old person knows that life changes so many times in your lifetime. We are experiencing this now. Right? So if life changes all the time, we cannot get married with methodologies because the methodologies need to adapt. Right? So it is the balance. It is the balance between uh, 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 emotions and creativity or action or the decision, the power to make a decision, you know, to do something and to express yourself as you are. Right? Uh, that takes, as I would say, balls. Right? So we have to be brave for that. We have a comment in chat from Patri Patricia. You can read it out or... Yes, uh, of course. When you accept your fears, you don't fight with them. You make them your friends and walk side to side with them. And this will allow you to move forward and find freedom. What, what she's saying is, when, when she says that your fears are your friends, is something about what we talked at the beginning, right? that uh, uh, fear is trying to tell you something. It's manifesting through an emotion, but we don't want to listen to it, right? So we react against, and we come up with excuses and we say, no, I'm not like that. I'm different. Don't push me, right? When we could be trying, 
and maybe experiencing a new aspect of our personality. When I decided, as I told you, uh, to change from the world of technology to social entrepreneurship, that was a big, big change. I said no to money. I said no to what I learned all my life. I said no to all the people I met in so many years. I said no to a lot of the achievements I did. So creating a new version of me was a big challenge and it took, it took a lot of, uh, uh, of time. And believe me, I didn't notice, but I had my backpack of fears intact. The change itself was not enough, right? Uh, but the change made me see some of the fears that I had on my backpack and allowed me to, to forgive myself and to outgrow those fears. And now I listen to them. One, one of my fears manifests in tiredness. When I'm starting to feel like a bit panicky and tired, it is often because I'm telling yes to people that I know that they're abusing of me. And I know that the solution to that is to tell them no and to stand up and go for a walk. So to disconnect my head. And when I return, I'm feeling great. So I learned to listen to that specific fear. You don't need to say yes to everybody, Jose. Right? And why do I need to say yes to everybody? But it's basically because I want to be accepted. So if I want to be accepted, that means that I have fear of not being accepted. Right? Yesterday uh, or two days ago, I received an amazing question from a university that I'm probably going to be working with. And they asked me, okay, Jose, you need to tell us what's your uh, uh, highest uh, level of, of um, what is this called? Like this university degrees. Oh my God, I said th that question again. Because I never finished the university and the post degree that I got in Peru is not compatible with, with the European system. So basically here I'm, I'm a complete uneducated person. And uh, I hate that because that goes precisely to my fear of not being accepted. But now I know it, right? So now I can say to them, without feeling bad, hey, wait, you touched <laughs> a soft spot here. And, uh, and actually that vulnerability, as Mladenka would say, helps me to communicate with them and they find empathy with me. Therefore they come up with solutions and alternatives. So that's so amazing. So that's, that's and that's freedom. Now I feel free. I can be uneducated. <laughs> uh, so, let me share with you this quote from Alan Watts, that he's one of my favorites. And he says, uh, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Logic, intelligence, and reason are satisfied, by the, but the heart goes hungry. So you just imagine the traditional corporation that wants to make money, that are very logical, very uh, 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 intelligent collectively, they plan everything, you know, and they feel unsatisfied. They, they feel dissatisfied. Uh, their hearts are hungry. And the reason why they stay there is because they are afraid of losing it. So in this book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, Basically, the conclusion is what we already said. We have to make a balance between our intelligence, our logic, but we have to take care of what our emotions are trying to say. What is our fear trying to tell us? One of the ways that I found to propel this change is identifying purpose. Of course, purpose can be personal, right? Individual, or it can be collective. So if we want to go back or, or into the world of business, we have to talk obviously uh, uh, about purpose. 
purpose is not business model, right? So purpose is why do we have a business model? And I found that it has three characteristics. One is it has to be enjoyable. So your purpose has to be enjoyable. It has to make you feel good. Even if you are grinding yourself, you know, even if you have to make a lot of effort and you feel the pain, you know, but you enjoy it. The other one is that it's intentional. So it is not unconscious. It is intentional, you decide. So you ask this surfer there and his father is asking him, what the hell are you doing? You should be in the office. But the surfer said, no dad, I'm a surfer, right? It's intentional. But the most important thing of purpose is that keeps you in balance. And I'm going to tell you why. This is how I see how we walk in time. So the, this line here is the, the line of time. Uh, one of the extremes is the past and the other one is the future, of course, right? Now, if I go with all of you to one restaurant, so we get a lot of rakia and we start dancing and everything we are in an extreme level of happiness. Can be called elation, okay? So we're feeling, yeah, we can do whatever. We are so amazingly happy that we are going to take the car and we are going to drive full speed just for the fun of it. And then the police is going to come, they're going to stop us and we will wake up in jail, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that when we are extremely happy, we can make stupid decisions. Now in the other extreme, we have depression, we have uh, 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 anxiety and all these complicated kind of low energy uh, uh, emotions, emotional states. So there, we don't want to decide. We are paralyzed by fear. So, but we experience those things. So, and, and we are not going to stop experiencing them. So what I'm saying is just, th that's how it happens. You see this green part is the part when your emotions are somehow in uh, a space where you feel okay. In my experience, when I'm feeling depressed or anxious and I ask myself, what should I do to elevate my way of feeling so that I'm in the threshold of feeling okay, the green one, my answer is always connected with my purpose in life. And look, it is very simple because my purpose is to learn from people, to teach people. So I, I, I learn and I teach what I learn. So nothing of what you are listening today is really original. It's, it's things that I read, it's things that someone said, and I just picked it up, collected and, and presented to you. Uh, so when I'm feeling low, very, very low, I know that the little step towards talking with someone and sharing something that I learned is inviting one of my friends from here around the house for lunch. Tomas, poor Tomas has to pay all the broken glasses because when I feel bad, I call him and I said, let's go for Malitza. That is like an early lunch here. And uh, we go for Malitza and he talks about his cars and the Formula One that I don't understand anything. And I said a couple of things of whatever that I learned the past week and he listens. We finish our Malitza 
And I return home feeling new. My, it's not that I'm already feeling super energized, but I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not anxious anymore. So your purpose in life is there for you to make the question, am I aligned with my purpose? If the answer is yes, I'm, I can warranty you that you are feeling all right. You can be a bit low. You can be a bit up. You know that life is going to push you up and down. The thing is how to modulate it so that you don't go to the extremes of going to too low energy that you cannot decide anything or too high energy that you decide stupid things. And the same happens with teams. Earlier, we were talking with Mariana about the importance of a smart networks and group of people that are uh, uh, that agree on what they care about, right? They agree on a vision. They agree on a set of values. Okay, so you sit down with the team and you ask them, what is our purpose as a team? And when we feel to beat ourselves up, ask, what do we need to do to align ourselves with our purpose? And every little step works because it brings movement into the uh, uh, situation. Uh, Jose. Yes. I apologize. Uh, maybe I missed the part of defining your purpose. What is your purpose? Uh, how? So the, the, the big question is how to find your purpose, right? Yeah. So I will tell you in a short way, because that's a whole workshop. <laughs> but uh, in a short way, I can tell you one methodology that always works. You find your purpose in the past. In your past. Uh, that means that if you ask yourself to remember the past year, which were the two or three moments when, where, where you felt fine. I'm not telling you super happy, huh? Felt fine. And then you go one more year and five years ago and 10 years ago, 20 years ago. You will be surprised because you will remember some moments, right? And not only that, you will find out that there's something in common. Now, it might feel very stupid, you know, because it's so freakingly simple that it, 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 it feels like, ah, it cannot be. So one friend of mine, for example, she was completely surprised because she felt happy when she was acting as a clown with people. No, no wonder she's an artist, she plays music. Her purpose, as she described it, that I love it, is to see the smiley eyes on the people. So when you find those things uh, uh, in common, you are going to find out that in your present moment, you also feel comfortable in that kind of situations, right? For example, I have a friend that says to me, I am the host. I am the person that always welcomes people. That's my purpose in life. I have to be a host. So what he does, well, he works for a development agency. He's an amazing person, you know? But he's the person that connects the entrepreneurs with the programs of the, of the development agency. He's hosting. And that's how he feels happy. If he's feeling bad and you send him an email telling, hey, Tomas, can you help me with this, this and that? In a second. Because that's his purpose. Any question, Dario? Uh, while I was listening to you, I was going 
one year back, three years back, five years back, and trying to find it. So uh, we'll come to that. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, you're welcome. Uh, cool. So remember that we talked about these personalities and culture, right? So the culture is kind of the average of our personalities. So what is a culture of fear? So this is very recent, right? And, and, and probably you know about it. So what happens when we say to the people for years and years that they are going to lose their livelihoods and the way of being? What happens when we say to the people that they are going to be attacked? What happens when we say that their uh, 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 way of life is threatened by foreign uh, uh, influences or cultures or whatever you want? In one level, it is true. So I'm not saying that in all the cases, the people lies on purpose to create a culture of fear. But even when we say to our little children, if you behave bad, I'm not giving you the Nintendo. What we are creating is a culture of fear. It's a condition, right? It's a conditional way of thinking. If, then that, right? But when the fear goes to the extreme, we have to defend ourselves and we become violent. And this we see it in companies, in businesses, in government, in society, in nations, the whole world. So of course, if someone is listening to me might think, Jose, you're oversimplifying the whole situation. And true, of course, it is a super ultra duper simplification It's much more complex. But at the end, we build a culture of fear when we use fear to manipulate others. I'm not saying that manipulation is wrong. In some cases, even when we are making marketing, we are trying to modify the perception of the others, right? Have you, have you seen that if you go to the New York Times and you register, right? You're going to start receiving emails to subscribe. And every 15 days or 30 days, you're going to receive the last chance to get an amazing discount. The same email comes the next month and the same email comes the next month. It's just crazy. Or you're walking on the streets now in January. Well, you now we cannot, Jesus. But when we can walk on the streets, we go to Austria, right? The Croatians and the Slovenians, we all jump to Austria in January because everything is cheaper, right? And you go to these amazing malls and everybody's almost fighting to find a parking place and to go to get the sales. So a sale that says from this day until this day is a culture of fear. It's telling you, if you don't buy now, you are not going to get the good price. So- I never thought, I never thought like this, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if it is good or bad, to be honest. But what I know is that the culture of fear only creates in us a resistance, a reaction against something. So if we talk about innovation, if we talk about a, a, a business culture for innovation, and we are keeping our employees scared what is going to happen? And, and we say, no, 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 but we give uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, bonuses for the people that sells the most. Okay, and for the ones that are not good sellers, what happens? They don't get the, the, the bonuses. So the people lives in a constant pressure, in a constant fear, right? So we have to 
be responsible to evaluate how are we designing our companies, our, our policies, because obviously no one that cares about innovation wants people scared. If we really want to make this world a better place, what we are talking about is changing the culture, is changing the culture of fear and creating a culture of freedom. We need to come up with a culture of freedom. So when can you innovate? So I'm inviting you to go again to this slider. When can you innovate? I'm, I'm pre presenting there some options, right? Uh, uh, you can scroll down. Uh, well, you can mark the ones that you think are okay. So isn't this amazing? When I feel safe, when I feel welcome, when I'm not afraid of failure, when I'm inspired, when I feel comfortable. Only 33% of you when I'm in the right team. Wow. So that means that you are a good team member wherever you are, right? It doesn't depend so much on the team. So being a good team player and getting the best out of yourself is basically about your feelings. You, you said it, I didn't. Right? So do not forget this stuff. You know, because the majority of us think that we have to create companies and businesses that are so amazingly structured that we are not letting space for our emotions. So, and this is surprising. When I feel pressure, only 13%. A lot of people normally says that they have better results when they are under pressure. Okay, but look, 13%. So basically, what do we need? You just got a 1 million euros thing, you know? What do you need to do for your business, your next business, the company, your team to be more effective? Take care of how they feel. They want to be inspired and feel safe. They don't want to be afraid of failure. Of course, right? Because we want to do we want to be ourselves. As Mladenka said, we want to be our authentic self. That authentic self requires vulnerability. So uh, the next question is what is necessary for you to feel as good as a good team member? So I will change the, I will stop this one and start the next one. So you can go uh, refresh your page of uh, Slido and answer these questions. What is necessary for you to feel like a good team member? Wonderful. So 78% of you require uh, a mutual respect right? Precisely because of what we said before. If you want to be yourself and express yourself as you are, the other people need to respect you. No matter if you have no much experience, right? Okay. The team shares a common set of values. I can be as I am. There is clarity, honesty, and transparency, right? This is the structure that we were talking before. I can see the results of my personal and collective work, 56%. I need to feel useful, 44. So yeah, it is true. We, we do not need to be useful all the time. That's amazing. I want to have space and time to express myself, 33%. I can support team members with my experience, a clear vision, 
My team cares about my personal development, 22%. Cool. So we see that respect is what we need the most. Values, inclusion and tolerance, right? So that I can be as I am. And that there is clarity, honesty and transparency, right? So that the rules of the game in the, in the group are clear. So how hard can this be? So you can, you can check these percentages and ask yourself, what's the fear on the back of it? Why are we not having it? And you might be surprised with some interesting things. And remember, this can be answered as a person or as a team. And as I showed you before, the matryoshka or the babushka is an amazing example of the process of life. So when someone asks you, is it possible to be fearless? Well, nobody really knows. There are some people that say that yes. There are a lot of people that say that no. But if you remember the matryoshka, you will remember that it's a process. It's like life. One day you might go to the bigger one, have all the space and freedom that you want, or maybe not. You don't know how many dolls are nested inside. Because you start from the one in the middle, the little one. Right? So fearlessness is a process. And when I say, let's be fearless, let's be fully free. I'm not saying that let's cross the street so the trucks can kill us. Right? So I'm talking about psychological fear. I'm not talking about the instinctual fear that tries to defend our body. I'm not talking about not having fear of death. You know? Uh, I'm talking about recognizing which are the patterns that you created in your life that limit your power to be creative, that limit your power to decide Basically, that limits your freedom, limits your expression. And not only the expression of your voice or your singing when you take a shower, is the, is the, is the freedom of being you. How many persons that you know, if you ask them, do you know who are you? Who are you? They will tell, hey, that's such, such a philosophical question. I, I really don't know. Obviously, we don't know who we really are. Because we were not thinking about it. We were thinking on what we need to be in order to succeed in life, in order to get a good job, in order to have a good wife, a good husband, uh, in order to be accepted. So the whole process of building the fortress so again, as I said before, if we manage to deconstruct fear, right? If we move away all the bricks, all the patterns of resistance that we build to protect ourselves and we become free, we are becoming free to be who we are. So that's a person that we don't know, right? Or that we forgot about, maybe. So that's it from me. I have a question, if I may. <clears throat> sure. Uh, when, uh, when it's too much emotions, because you said uh, we need to give emotions and we have to somehow build a culture in the organization that people express their emotions freely and that we accept that, but can there be a situation that we give too much emotions and then people cannot really handle that and then they start to, to fear? You know, it, 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 lo it looks like a paradox, but I just wonder because I had some situation like that and I, um, I, yeah, just hear what you think. 
So everything this this is going to sound a bit spiritual, okay? But anyway, I will I will I, I will try to give an answer. Everything starts when you are capable of accepting how you are today. And that includes all your emotions. Even if your emotions are in excess. If you are ultra happy, if you are ultra de depressed, if you are ultra exaggerated with your emotions, if someone touches you and you say, ouch, if you are ultra sensitive, whatever it is, that's how you are right now. And there's nothing that you can do about it. You are just who you are today. When you accept that, you know, when you say, yeah, I'm, I'm ultra sensitive. So don't even touch me because I'm going to bite or cry or whatever, right? You will feel so great because you allowed yourself to be like that. And if the others do not accept your excess of emotion or your excess of logic or your excess of whatever, that's their problem. It's not yours. We are not here looking for the approval of anybody else. Well, let me take this opportunity, Antonia, to, con to congratulate you because um, every time that I listen to you, it's, it's amazing. And, uh, and thank you very much because you not just share with all of us your acknowledge, but you open your heart and, uh, and um, you become you. And I think that's the very, very important part, right? And you're teaching us that there's nothing wrong to be that way and, uh, and to follow, to follow uh, who we really are. And don't forget about, you know, um, kindness and, uh, and put all that fear uh, somewhere else, some aside and, and become us, right? And I think society and people and world will be much, much, much better. Thank you so much, Antonia. It was really great. Thank you for your energy and all of your insights. And I'm sure we'll work together again. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. And we've really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. Super. Take Thank care, you. guys. Thank you all.